Good afternoon, OSHER colleagues. Uh, delighted to see so many of you. Uh, I'm Steve Clary at the University of California, San Diego OSHER Lifelong Learning Institute. I am the chair of the curriculum committee and will be the host of this afternoon's presentation. And we're very, very pleased to welcome back our OSHER colleague, distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry at UC San Diego. Joel is a terrific contributor to many organizations within the University of California system and a consultant with NASA, highly regarded in his field. Uh, he spoke to us a few years ago about his project uh, called Anatomy of Malice, looking at the Nazi war criminals. Uh, last year, he spoke about Heaven's Gate, uh, the religious cult that went through a mass suicide of 37 people up at Rancho Santa Fe. And today he's embarked on a new project called the 21st century, oh, excuse me, the 20th century history of persuasion. And he's gonna to talk today about the first of two cases uh, uh, where persuasion and psychiatric coercion has come into play. And the first one will be with Patty Hurst uh, and her work um, within the Symbionese Liberation Army. Uh, we're pleased to have Joel with us. He, uh, was recruited away from Harvard University uh, back in the mid 80s and has had a distinguished career here at UC San Diego and contributes in many ways. And Joel, thank you for taking time out of your busy publishing career with his new book on today's subject. Welcome everybody. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging to present a talk to old friends uh, across the Zoom airwaves. Uh, I'll imagine that I'm sitting in the, the familiar OSHA room with everybody. And um, I'd like to go through a, a new project of mine that I'm calling Dark Persuasion. And as Steve mentioned, I actually gave um, one talk on this last year to OSHA uh, without really figuring out how it all meshed together. Uh, but the, I, the, the work is, uh, I guess, the intellectual history of how brainwashing developed in the 20th century. And I ask a couple questions, overall questions, and that is the, um, what political forces were at work? Um, and what were the people, what were the scientists doing, and what were their individual motivations that made them interested in uh, taking on uh, this really dark uh, topic? Today, I'd like to talk about a California story that riveted attention back in the 70s, and that was the kidnapping and possible political conversion of Patty Hearst. So let me um, first try to share my screen. Okay, at least on my end, I think, uh, I think we've got some share screens. So um, what I'd like to do is to uh, summarize uh, the evidence uh, about Patty Hearst, uh, and I'd really like you to be the jurors. Uh, so I'll present the case to you. I'll be your resource person. And at the end of the lecture, I will po be posing one question. Um, do you, OSHER members of the jury, wish to find her guilty or not guilty of armed robbery of the Hibernia Bank in San Francisco. And when we get there, I'll show you uh, how to vote uh, on the Zoom platform. So Patty grew up in Hillsboro, California. She was an heiress of the Hearst Publishing Empire. She describes uh, her upbringing as carefree, affluent, slightly rebellious against her parents' strictures. 
Her mother, Catherine, was a UC regent, and her father, um, Randolph, was chairman of the board of the Hearst Publishing Empire. This is Patty's description, and I'd like to read it because I think it's so moving. Um, I grew up in an atmosphere of clear blue skies, bright sunshine, rambling open spaces, long green lawns, large comfortable houses, country clubs with swimming pool and tennis courts and riding horses, and I took it all for granted. I live now on a private protected street in a house equipped with the best electronic security system available. I do not live in fear. It's just that I feel older and wiser now. I am aware of the dark reality that I am vulnerable, that there are forces out there which are ever threatening and which are stronger than any single individual. This is a picture of Patty and her parents. Um, and um, uh, Patty and her uh, fiance, Stephen uh, Weed. The um, Patty and Stephen lived in this off campus house in uh, Berkeley. Stephen was a philosophy graduate student. Patty was, uh, I think, a freshman at, at Berkeley at the time. She was smolderingly angry and depressed about the relationship with Stephen. And the prosecution would later argue that her ki kidnapping was actually her ticket out of a bad relationship. So let's review the kidnapping. For it was a terrible misfortune that Patty came to the attention of Donald DeFreeze. Donald headed a small violent revolutionary group in Oakland called the Symbionese Liberation Army or the SLA. This is a sample of uh, DeFreeze's um, writing. You know me, you've always known me, that nigger you have hunted and feared night and day. I'm that nigger you have killed hundreds of my people in a vain hope of finding. I'm the nigger that is no longer just hunted, robbed, and murdered. I'm the nigger that hunts you now. Yes, you know me, you know us all, and we know you, the oppressor, the murderer, and robber. Now we are the hunters that will give you no rest. Death to the fascist insect, insect that preys upon the people. For unclear reasons, months before uh, Hearst's kidnapping, the SLA assassinated Oakland's popular African-American school superintendent. They shot him with cyanide-laced bullets and issued incoherent communiques about the coming revolution. As a result, they were spurned by the other revolutionary groups and they struggled to devise some crime that would get them better press. Three months later, they had it. The SLA decided to kidnap Patty Hearst. That target should get them attention. Furthermore, by extracting a sufficient ransom from the Hearst family to be distributed to the poor, they thought that they could be viewed as kind of Robin Hoods of the Bay Area. The SLA had no um, clearly articulated program. Uh, Donald DeFries dabbled in reading various revolutionary literature while he was in prison, and he longed for the glorious life of a professional revolutionary. He proclaimed himself Donald, he proclaimed himself General Field Marshal Sink Matume of the SLA and attracted a, a handful of followers who were principally white, middle-class, educated youth. They played with guns and decided they needed more drama, so they designed a special emblem 
a, a banner with a seven headed cobra. They gave each other revolutionary sounding names drilled with weapons and spun grandiose fantasies how they would avenge themselves on racism, sexism, ageism, capitalism, individualism, et cetera, et cetera. And they always ended their communiques deaf to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. On the evening of February 4th, 1974, 19-year-old Patricia Hurst was violently kidnapped from her Berkeley apartment at gunpoint, struck in the face with the butt of a gun and stuffed into the trunk of a car. She was imprisoned in this closet, blindfolded and manacled for almost two months while her captors hectored her about her life of privilege. During the pre-trial, various people would assert that it wasn't such a bad closet, that it was even carpeted inside. There would be only three surviving witnesses to her kidnapping and treatment by the SLA, and their version of events differs greatly. Everyone else was killed. You'll have to choose whose testimony you believe. And that was one of the tasks of the original jury. But you are a fresh jur jury. You have to make up your own mind. Who's telling, whose version is more or less self-serving? Whose version do you believe more? Over the course of two months of indoctrination, Hearst started parroting some of the group's ideas, and her restraints were gradually lessened. According to Hearst, the leader of the group sexually assaulted her. The group harangued her, calling her a bourgeois bitch and a spoiled rich brat. Um, but some of the group showed her occasional acts of kindness, letting her out of the closet to for, go to the bathroom, telling her when she was panicking, panicking that it's only a closet for Christ's sake. During her captivity, she released various tapes and communiques. The first tape came four days after she was seized. It was straightforward enough, a frightened sounding message to her parents, begging that they pay her ransom. Her kidnappers demanded that the Hearst family pay a ransom of millions of dollars worth of food to be delivered to California's poor. There were back and forth negotiations regarding the amount of the ransom and how to distribute the food. When the food distributions be began, it was sheer chaos with near riots. People were struck and injured by frozen turkeys flung from the distribution trucks. Subsequent tapes from Patricia sounded like she was reading from some revolutionary script. She called for freedom of oppressed people, referred to her family as the pig hearsts, and spoke of herself as a soldier in the people's army. Eight days after, eight weeks after she was kidnapped, the SLA gave Patricia a choice of joining the group or leaving. Patricia changed her name to Tanya, joined the group, and on April 15th, 1974, was seen as part of the gang robbing the Hibernia Bank in San Francisco. Subsequently, more tapes emerged with Hearst's voice on it, espousing increasingly radicalized views. Her parents speculated that she must have been brainwashed to say and do such things. And Patty fired back repeatedly over the ensuing weeks and months, vehemently denying that she was brainwashed. The attorney general commented that law enforcement would hunt down the bank robbers and that Hearst clearly had joined the group and was a criminal as well. Patty then began to question 
whom she had to fear more, her captors or the police. As she subsequently described it, the kidnapping was incredibly brutal. She was crying in the trunk of the car when Sink threatened her, shut your mouth, bitch, or I'm gonna blow your fucking head off. Meanwhile, she was the SLA's prisoner of war. In her autobiography, she wrote, I was put into a closet that was padded. I thought they would kill me. I was told that I had been arrested because I was the daughter of Randolph Hearst, who was regarded as a corporate enemy of the people. Sink told me that the SLA was a huge army with units in Ireland, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The kidnappers absolutely controlled all communications to me. Hourly interrogation started on the third day of my captivity. I had difficulty walking, became weak, depressed, and confused. William Wolfe and Donald DeFries raped me while I was in the closet. The group mocked Patty, telling her she came across like an heiress because she requested to leave the closet because, quote, I have to go to the bathroom, end quote. Sink replied, look at her, the fancy la di da lady, a real Marie Antoinette. Listen, if you gotta go pee, say I gotta go pee. If you gotta take a shit, say I gotta take a shit. Patty learned to agree with everything they said to feign an interest in every one of their concerns. Her captors then would be friendlier and the closet door would be open. Joel, we've lost your screen. Okay. Patty joined the group, participated in the bank robbery, and on May 9th, I'm sorry, May 1974, the gang was hiding out in Los Angeles when Tanya, Patty, and gang members Bill and Emily Harris converged on Mills Sporting Goods Store in LA. Bill was caught shoplifting and Patty, wearing her new persona, as Tanya. Patty was alone in this car. She fired bursts of machine gun to uh, get Bill released. Uh, Patty, Bill, and Emily fled. Uh, Patty wrote years later, I couldn't believe that I'd actually fired the machine gun, that I'd actually helped in the escape of these two people whom I hated. I acted instinctively because I had been trained and drilled to do that, just like Pavlov's salivating dog. Tanya, Bill, and Emily hid out in Disneyland. Meanwhile, the next day, the remaining six gang members were killed and incinerated in an apocalyptic shootout with the LA police. Tanya and the Harrises disguised, disguised themselves and disappeared for 18 months, traveling to the East Coast and working with a writer who wanted to tell their story. Tanya confided to the writer that she didn't trust the SLA in the beginning, but pretty quickly got over that mistrust and started to feel sympathetic with their goals. She, just, she decried the allegations that she had been brainwashed as bullshit and that brainwashing should refer to the process which begins in the school system, whereby the people are conditioned to passively take their place in society as slaves of the ruling class. The fact that she'd said these things while traveling with her supported supposed mortal enemies, the Harrises, would come up in court. Why hadn't she run away from them all those many months of travel? 
Patty complained that Bill Harris had a volcanic temper and that Emily Harris was actually the more terrifying of the two because she was such a committed ideologue of the SLA. Um, Emily Harris was said to have murdered uh, uh, a bank customer at a subsequent robbery. And then Emily was said, uh, Patty said, Emily replied, oh, the customer's dead, but it doesn't really matter. She was a bourgeois pig anyway, because her husband is a doctor. Sadly for Hearst, she was fated to spend life on the run with Bill and Emily for a year and a half before their eventual capture. She claimed they dominated her and terrified her. She stated she could never have run away from them because they would follow and kill her. Bill Harris disputed these allegations, stating he tried to comfort Patty even during her earliest kidnapping experience. Similarly, he denied that Sink had raped her. Bill and Emily Harris were eventually tried for Patty Hearst kidnapping, um, and they denied that uh, Hearst had suffered uh, any bodily harm. Emily Harris was one of those who said, after all, the closet was carpeted, and they did let her out from time to time to go to the bathroom. Uh, furthermore, she scoffed at Patty's claims um, of injury during the initial uh, kidnapping and said that Patty only had a couple scuffing up and scratches. The Harrises consistently report that Patty's mistreatment comes only from her mouth. They claim that they always tried to calm and comfort her so that she wouldn't be a security problem. And that as time wore on and they grew to trust her, they kept the door open and spent time with her. They did report that they all worked on the communiques together, but that Patty had converted so strongly to a radical cause that they had to tone down Patty's statements because they sounded too militant to be believable. There were inconsistent reports about her relationship with SLA member William Wolfe, uh, also known as Cujo. Wolfe had been killed in the LA attack on the SLA safe house. Patty claimed that he had raped her and she despised him, but the Harrises asserted that she was sexually attracted to him and actually sought him out. Hearst's relationship with Cujo would become a crucial matter on trial. Cujo had given her a small, inexpensive Mexican figurine, which she was seen wearing in photographs while she was with the gang. Furthermore, when she was arrested, the figurine was in her purse. If she had been raped by Cujo and detested him, why would she carry this love token from him? Why also, um, after he was killed in the SLA shootout, would she write, he was the gentlest, most beautiful man I've ever known. We loved each other so much and his love for the people was so deep that he was willing to give his life for them. Hearst would say that she was merely reading a prepared script authored by Emily Harris, and that she held on to the figurine because she naively believed what Cujo had told her, that it was valuable. During her psychiatric examination and during the trial, there was a prurient fascination with her relationship with Wolf. One of the psychiatric examiners uh, brought her to tears with aggressive questions. Tell me about the seduction. Did you kiss him? Was he circumcised? Tell me about your lover. So it's very important to appreciate the compressed timeline of all of these events. Patty was kidnapped in February. Two months later, she becomes Tanya. 
Two weeks later, she robs a bank. One month later, there's this violent shootout at Mills Sporting Good. All of this occurred in very short order of time. The gang eventually returned to the West Coast, attracted some new followers, and committed more crimes. They planned to assassinate uh, Robert McNamara and physicist Edward Teller, but they never got around to it. They did, however, bomb a Bank of America branch in Oakland, a building on the UC Santa Cruz campus. They bombed the Marin County Civic Center, various police cars, and conduct conducted another bank robbery where they killed uh, a pregnant woman. Patty was finally arrested on September 18th, 1975. And I'd like you to be considering these questions. Don't vote yet. Was she guilty of armed robbery? And should her kidnapping influence your determination of guilt or your uh, ideas about her sentence? So I'm going to summarize the evidence presented at the trial. The trial focused on her initial behaviors upon being arrested and extensive psychiatric testimony. When she was jailed, she gave a power to the people fist salute and stated her occupation was urban guerrilla. Her jailer surreptitiously recorded a conversation between Patty and her best friend, Trish Tobin. Uh, during this conversation in the visiting area uh, of the jail, Patty made some damaging statements. Patty, I'm not making any statements until I know I can get out. Then I'll issue a statement and it'll be a revolutionary feminist perspective, totally. And I'll just tell you, like, my politics are real different. And so this creates all kinds of problems for me in terms of a defense. You see, those things that I'm charged with are really fucked up, and it really kind of pisses me off. Once I get out of here, I'll be able to tell you all kinds of stories that you just wouldn't believe. The trial of U.S. v. Hearst revisited the brainwashing question as a legal defense. These issues about psychology and criminal justice have consumed us. They, they keep cropping up in Osher classes in the past year. And this is a slightly different version of those questions. So does brainwashing constitute uh, a defense? Uh, so it's important to remember, and certainly the attorneys in the class know this, that trials really are dialectical struggles. If there's a truth to be extracted from a verdict, it is found at the intersection of existing laws, the arguments that the prosecution and defense make, the evidence that's presented, the judge's guidance, and the jury's deliberation. Please keep that in mind. So in terms of clarity of the law, uh, unlike homicide, where there are gradations, murder, manslaughter, justifiable homicide, there are no gradations for bank robbery. It's hard to argue I stumbled and accidentally robbed the bank while I was trying to make a deposit. Similarly, uh, the argument that the bank needed robbing wouldn't get very far, no matter how despicably the bank had behaved. Likewise, the degree of impulsivity versus premeditation doesn't exactly affect the verdict either, although it may affect the sentencing. There is one area that might constitute a defense against the charge of bank robbery. The judge said 
if somebody threatened to kill you unless you robbed a bank, that's extreme duress and that would be mitigating. And the defense made that point. In Hearst's trial, the judge emphasized that the duress must be immediate and personal. A vague, indefinite threat is not exculpatory. Thus, the duress defense would not be valid if someone threatened saying, trust me, I will come after you or your family someday when you least expect it. But what if the person was very believable and you knew he had a long memory? Um, that didn't count according to the judge's instructions. Would the jury accept those instructions or would they choose to regard those uh, duress uh, arguments as extreme under the situation? The SLA told Peirce that they were part of a terrorist organization with roots in many countries. They had already demonstrated their murderous violence. Patty claimed she didn't turn herself in during many months on the road because she was sure the SLA would come after her or her family. Indeed, throughout the long trial, there were constant threats by sinister radical groups and demands that the Hearst family fund the legal defense of other SLA members. There were bombings of the Hearst Castle in San Simeon and another Hearst family mansion. There were bomb threats against the courthouse and death threats against the judge, the prosecution, and various witnesses. According to the judge's instructions to the jury, these didn't count as duress, because they weren't immediate or personal. You as the jury have to consider that matter for yourselves. Well, what about the prosecution and the defense? Many have criticized her uh, flamboyant defense attorney, F. Lee Bailey, claiming that he needlessly subjected her to a prison sentence when he could have made a plea deal. They said he had a conflict of interest, that he was promoting a book and he needed a long trial for publicity. But most of all, people criticize him for his decision to put Hearst on the stand. Patty testified movingly about her kidnapping and terrorization, but once Bailey had put her on the stand, she faced questions from the prosecution about her activities after the Hibernia robbery. What other crimes had she committed? Why didn't she run away? She refused to answer such questions 42 times on the basis of self-incrimination. And she also refused because she felt this was, she, she was still in danger or her family would be in danger. Again, the duress argument. Bailey was active and passionate in her defense throughout the trial. He reminisced about his first meeting with Patty, describing her as a very numb person, as if she'd been anesthetized. She looked almost tiny. Her responses were flat, invariably delivered in a monotone. She resembled to me a retarded person, one with noticeably diminished capacity. On the other side was James Browning, the lead prosecutor. Browning's remarks were enormously effective. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask you to reject the defendant's entire testimony as not credible. She asks us to believe she didn't mean what she said on the tapes. She didn't mean what she wrote in the documents. She didn't mean it when she gave this clenched fist salute after her arrest. That that was out of fear of the Harrisons, she tells us. She didn't mean it when she told the sheriff that she was an urban guerrilla. She says the Tobin conversation wasn't the real Patty Hearst, that the Mills shooting incident was simply a reflex. She was in such fear she couldn't accept, she couldn't escape in 19 months while crisscrossing the country. She couldn't stand Willie Wolf 
and yet she carried the stone face with her until the day she was arrested. It's too big a pill to swallow, ladies and gentlemen. It does not wash. I ask you whether you would accept this incredible story from anyone but Patty Hearst, and if you wouldn't, don't accept it from her either. Well, what about the quality of the evidence? There was no doubt that Patty had participated in the Hibernia bank robbery. The question was why, or more properly, what was her intent? For this, both sides relied on extensive psychiatric testimony. Indeed, half of the trial was consumed with expert witnesses on both sides. Bailey suggested, ba Bailey selected three outstanding American psychiatrists and psychologists who'd worked extensively with the US military during the Korean War, where the whole concept of brainwashing was developed. Margaret Singer um, specialized in uh, psychological testing and speech characteristics. Singer pointed out that when Hearst was arrested, her IQ had dropped 20 points. And Singer also analyzed Hearst's speaking and writing characteristics and testified that many of the communiques and tapes simply were not in Patty's style. The prosecution picked away at this and suggested that Hearst had faked her psychological testing to make her look more impaired than she was. Furthermore, they argued that perhaps Hearst started voluntarily emulating the writing style of her SLA captors. There was no argument about her competency to stand trial. Rather, the defense argued subtly that her degree of impairment demonstrated the lingering effect of the extreme duress that she had been under during her captivity. Jolly West provided a magnificent overview of brainwashing and coercive persuasion from the Korean War. He admitted that the term brainwashing is sort of a grab bag and then described his experience in Korea. Captives are more persuadable when they are in a state of debility, dependency, and dread. He called it DDD. When a prisoner is worn out from malnutrition, sleep deprivation, and medical issues, debility ensues. When the patient is forced to turn to his captor for everything, uh, go to the bathroom, standing up, walking, the prisoner de develops a profound dependency. Finally, when the patient is constantly threatened with death, the, the, the prisoner has extensive dread. West said that Hearst faced all of these DDD situations in her captivity. And he noticed that when the POWs from Korea were released from prison, they commonly reported feeling numb, depressed, anxious, and fearful. He noted that Hearst had the same sorts of complaints. He also pointed out that very few of the Korean POWs attempted to escape from their prisoner of war camps. And he inferred, uh, inferred that this was attributable to the DDD and suggested that this might also account for Patty's failure of, of making an escape effort. West said that POWs were liable to dissociation, splitting off aspects of memory and feeling in the face of massive stress. He said that in, in Tanya's case, it gave her a chance to put out of her mind the old Patty Hearst, her feelings about her family, to cut herself off as much as she could from the past. It was like she was putting on psychological armor so that she couldn't think about the unbearable thoughts. West's testimony was powerful and damaging to the prosecution. So of course they attacked him viciously. Uh, West had made a point of saying that he had done little forensic work and the prosecutor then pigeonholed him as an ivory tower academic. 
And while West had numerous extensive experience with the Korean prisoners of war, the prosecutors suggested that his experience was dated. After all, this was 20 years ago. The prosecution criticized West because no matter what Hearst said, West fit it into his conceptual mold. If she reported a symptom, he believed her. If she denied a symptom, it meant she was dissociating. It was all too neat and couldn't be disproved no matter what the evidence showed. Furthermore, West was confusing his role. Was he supposed to be her therapist or was he objectively evaluating her to form expert opinion? The prosecution said that that Jolly had uh, prejudged the matter because he had written to Patty's parents during her SLA captivity, saying that they should have hope and that if Patty would treat it appropriately, she would recover. How could he say that even before examining her? The prosecution also said that he was too cozy with the Hearst family. After all, he had dined with them and suggested that as a UCLA employee, he was somehow beholden to Patty Hearst's mother, who was a regent of the university. Martin Orne discussed why he thought Patty was telling the truth. He based his testimony about uh, his research on detecting dissembling. Orne felt that Hearst was telling the truth about how she was treated by the SLA because she didn't try to magnify her symptoms in an effort to win sympathy the way a malingerer might. He suggested that Hearst must have dissociated under the trauma, which might explain why she couldn't remember things, why she felt in a daze during the bank robbery. Furthermore, she was, when she was Tanya, playing a role like the isolated POWs did in Korea. And such role playing can become sticky or real. Orn testified, I believe that she continued to rehearse the role continuously because she had no opportunities for getting out of it. We sometimes play roles. The man who hates his boss may play the role of liking the boss but then he can come home and tell his wife how he really feels towards his boss. If you isolated somebody totally and you make him play a role on the threat of death and you don't allow him to have someone with whom he can ever validate himself, that's when the role becomes more and more real. <clears throat> the prosecution retorted, um, by repeating many of her statements when she was captured, that she was pissed about being captured, that she was a radical feminist. How could Orne be sure this wasn't the truth? Maybe she had merely changed her mind and viewed things differently. Why did one need to invoke things like dissociation to explain what happened? Wasn't it self-serving for her to assert that she did all these things because she'd been accustomed to role playing the part. The final defense expert, uh, Robert Lifton, provided a magnificent overview of his work uh, with Chinese thought reform prisoners. And he pointed out that extensive interrogation and confession used by the Chinese were potent vehicles for changing thoughts and behaviors. And he thought that he pointed out that thought reform is facilitated when prisoners are made to feel guilty about their background. And he referred to uh, Hearst's laminating sessions with where the SLA uh, critiqued um, her background. He pointed out that in situations like Korea, life itself was called into question daily. And that in such situations, when guards were occasionally lenient or kind, prisoners could be manipulated more easily. He said very clearly that her participation in the bank robbery and her firing the machine gun in LA 
reflected the original terror she experienced in kidnapping and in the closet. You cannot understand what's happened in this young woman unless you appreciate the terror of, um, of the early period. This was again damaging testimony for the prosecution. So they asked Lifton to prove uh, that people had been brainwashed. They suggested his explanation for Hearst's behavior were baroque in their complexity and that the simplest explanation was that she had participated in all the crimes voluntarily. Enter the prosecution experts. The prosecution called two psychiatric experts who were strikingly different in background and temperament from the defense experts. Neither were experts in massive PTSD, trauma, or brainwashing, but both had extensive forensic experience. The prosecution experts described the world as black and white and used a simpler vocabulary. Personal characteristics aside, they articulated a view that people are responsible for the decisions they make, except under very narrow circumstances. They ridiculed the idea of brainwashing and dismissed the idea that Hearst was under duress for 18 months. And they emphasized that she had plenty of opportunities to escape, but simply chose not to. Joel Fort trained in psychiatry, but called himself a specialist in social and health problems. He distributed self-promoting uh, press releases in advance of the trial, which puffed himself up. He argued that academic psychiatrists with little forensic experience didn't have much to offer in court and that ex experts must be neutral and not to confuse the defendant with the patient. He viewed the Hearst trial as foolish and told the Hearst family from the outset that they should plea bargain for a lesser charge. He attacked the idea of brainwashing as unsubstantiated and vague, but he was caught up short when the defense revealed that he had relied precisely on a brainwashing defense in another case that he had given testimony on. The prosecution asked Dr. Ford, did the defendant at the time of the bank robbery have any mental disease or defect which substantially affected her capacity to conform her conduct to the law? Ford replied, no. She did not perform the bank robbery because she was in fear of her life. She did it as a voluntary member of the SLA. Dr. Ford thought that term, terms like coercive persuasion and thought reform were vague and that the issue boiled down simply to attitude change. Hearst had merely been converted by the SLA, fallen in with a bad crowd at a vulnerable time of her life and developed strong and affectionate, affectionate relationships with some of the SLA members. Not only that, it was exciting for her to get all the international attention. My feelings were that she was extremely independent, strong-willed, rebellious. She was an amoral person who thought laws she didn't agree with should be violated. He dismissed Hearst's concern that she would be shot by the FBI and commented that the closet where she was held for two months was not really so bad. He found no evidence that Hearst had been sleep deprived and pointed out to the numerous times in her uh, uh, communiques where she explicitly denied the possibility that she was brainwashed. Ford was exceedingly sure of himself in providing testimony. And in response, the defense pointed out that Dr. Dr. Ford had misrepresented countless elements of his CV. They didn't exactly say he'd lied repeatedly, but that was a clear takeaway. He claimed more forensic experience than he really had. He kept referring to his book, 
that he'd written on forensic psychiatry, but it turns out he never, um, uh, never had written such a book. He wasn't board certified and he had a checkered employment history. Furthermore, they unearthed a report from his supervisor who said that he was such a weak psychiatric resident, he should never do psychotherapy. All in all, all, in all they painted a pretty unsavory picture, but did that really rebut what he said about Patty Hearst? Boston psychiatrist Harry Kozel was the other prosecution expert. He ran a center for diagnosis and treatment of criminally dangerous sex offenders. And unlike Joel Fort, Kozel um, um, uh, was a clinician. He treated a lot of patients. He had considerable uh, clinical legitimacy. Uh, he had no animus against psychiatry and was very respectful of the opposing side. There was something different and difficult about Kozel's interactions with Patty Hearst. Kozel asked many questions indirectly, trying to put her at ease and to tiptoe into hot topics, but she repeatedly ran out of the interviews uh, with him in tears. He argued that she entered the bank voluntarily to rob it, and this was an act of her own free will. How did this come about? She was disillusioned and disenchanted with her fiance. He kept referring to her as this girl, and Patty, as a feminist in the early 70s, took umbrage with this greatly. Um, the, um, uh, this girl was disappointed and frustrated, a very proud girl with a great deal of dignity, but the girl who got kidnapped was a bitter, angry, confused person, angry at authority, angry at power, angry at hypocrisy and her fiance. So this is the girl who was picked up in a sense with no place to go. This girl was a rebel. Whatever developed in the subtle interplay of a million experiences in her life, she had gotten into a state where she was ripe for the plucking. She was ready for something. She was a rebel in search of a cause. And the cause found her in the sense that she was kidnapped by the cause, a terrible, terrible misfortune for her. Kozel scrutinized all the tapes that Patty had released while she was kidnapped, the communiques. He noted her initial fear and the early propagandistic tone of those early communiques. And he agreed that obviously those early communiques were not her writing. Uh, but he went on to say, I think she was a spiritual sister to the SLA, that she was ready for it a long, long time preceding the SLA. Kozel was effective, and the defense tried to paint him as a dirty old man who leeringly asked um, her questions about her sex life. They also pointed out that despite all his statements about her unhappy family life, he had never interviewed the family at all and never obtained any collateral information. They tried to impugn um, her, uh, I'm sorry, Kozel's integrity, and they called to the stand one of his formal colleagues. Um, the colleague suggested that Kozel was hardly objective in his assessment of Hearst, and that months before he'd even interviewed Patty, Kozel had described the Hearst family as a venal, disgusting people. If I'd grown up in a family like Patricia, you would understand what she is rebelling against. They're pigs. Years later, after the trial, Lifton described the, the trial as relentlessly adversarial and wrote how shocked he was that the prosecution psychiatrist could assert with straight faces that Hearst had voluntarily joined the SLA out of a deep rebellion against her parents, that, he was a, that she was a rebel in search of a cause. He went on to criticize the prosecution and defense attorneys. Robert Browning was a young, nasty, legally effective, and politically ambitious attorney. 
Bailey, perhaps the country's most famous criminal lawyer, was extremely intelligent, but had something of the style of a con man. He drank too many martinis at lunch and turned out to be commuting back and forth from legal seminars he was giving in Los Angeles. Judge Oliver Carter handled the attorneys firmly and respectfully and cooled things down with humor. He gave um, rulings clearly um, and he tried to move the trial along. It still required two months and the trial transcript runs in thousands and thousands of pages. In Carter's final instructions to the jury, he reminded them that there is no way of fathoming or scrutinizing the operations of the human mind. <clears throat> you may infer the defendant's intent from the surrounding circumstances. Intent and motive should never be confused. Motive is what prompts a person to act or fail to act. Intent refers only to the state of mind with which the act is done or omitted. And again, he hammered home this point about coercion or duress, that it can provide a legal excuse for a crime, but the compulsion must be present and immediate and of such a nature as to induce a fear of impending death. Prosecutor Browning focused his closing comments on the question of mental intent, psychiatric opinion, and Hearst credibility. He reminded the jury that we can't unscrew the top of the head and peer over the rim and say right there, that was the intent on the date of the robbery. Then he commented that any defendant's testimony would be self-serving and unreliable but one could draw inferences from other data. For instance, her behavior in Los Angeles when she fired a machine gun to help her SLA companions escape. She had been alone at that point and she could have escaped. Furthermore, there'd been many times that she'd stood guard in the apartment while the other members slept. Browning characterized the defense strategy as a duress defense and that all the talk about psychological coercion was injected by the defense in the hope that if duress doesn't stick to the ceiling, maybe something else will. He disparaged the defense psychiatrists as academic psychiatrists who were inexperienced in forensic matters and who were gullible. Browning reminded the jury about Hearst's many inaccuracies and false statements. In his closing, defense attorney Bailey reminded the jury that the only kidnapped victims who survive are those who cooperate with their captors and that the FBI had threatened Hearst while she was at large. He tried to refocus the trial. This is not a case about bank robbery. It's a case about dying or surviving. That is all Patty Hearst thought about a young girl who had absolutely no political motivations or history of activity of any kind was rudely snatched from her home, clouded on the side of the head with a gun and taken as a political prisoner. You're not here to answer the question whether she robbed the bank. The question you're here to answer is why? And would you have done the same thing to survive or was it her duty to die to avoid committing a felony? So here are the questions. And in a moment, I'm going to dismiss, the, dismiss you all to go into seclusion for your decisions uh, about the case. I'll be asking you, was she guilty? Um, what do you think about this argument about coercion or brainwashing versus had she simply changed her mind? And if you do decide uh, that she was guilty, um, should her kidnapping influence the Senate, the sentence? Um, I will tell you 
what the jury decided, but you are another jury, so you need to vote for yourselves. So the, the jury decided, they found Patty Hearst guilty. It was not easy on them. The jurors wept and vomited because of the stress of the deliberations. They had been sequestered for two months as the trial dragged on. But evidence outweighed sympathy. They recalled all the questions about her veracity. Um, and ultimately they found her guilty. On the other hand, the alternative, the alternate juror who'd sat through the whole trial but never was impaneled with the rest of the group, um, the alternate juror said she would never have voted guilty because if they had never kidnapped her, she would never have been in that bank. So the question then comes down to sentencing and whether her kidnapping should influence the sentence. Sadly, um, Judge Carter died after this long trial before he was ready to uh, uh, announce a sentencing. A new judge was uh, brought in and um, he decided to sentence her, gave her the average sentence for a first time offender bank robber in California in those days. And that was seven years. So he gave her no um, special um, consideration for the circumstances of the robbery. Indeed, uh, he commented that rebellious young people who for whatever reason become revolutionaries and voluntarily commit criminal acts will be punished. But interestingly, um, this was just one of many trials for Patty Hearst. There were other trials. Um, there were trials of uh, Emily and Bill Harris for Patty Hearst kidnapping. There were trials of the shooting at Mills Sporting Goods Store. Uh, there were Patty's appeals. And during all these various trials, she needed a bodyguard. And here, life started turning out better for her. She fell in love with her bodyguard and the two subsequently engaged and got married. Around the time of Patty Hearst kidnapping, two other events happened, which started people questioning the justice of her sentence. In August, 1973, during a Stockholm bank robbery, the hostages paradoxically grew fond of the bank robbers and turned against the police. Was something like that going on with Patty Hearst? More importantly, the shocking murder and mass suicide of a thousand people in Jonestown in November 1978 made people wonder more about brainwashing and coercive persuasion. Many people started advocating for Patty's release and they were odd political bedfellows like Senator Hayakawa, Ronald Reagan, Cesar Chavez. Her Congressman Leo Ryan was one of her greatest champions, writing her in prison just before leaving for Jonestown. He said, I'm off to Guyana. I'll see you when I return, hang in there he would never return because he would be murdered days later in Jonestown. The Jonestown connection kept striking others. It showed a skeptical world that perhaps brainwashing wasn't such a bogus concept after all. John Wayne, of all people, drew the logical connection between Patty Hearst's experience and Jonestown. He wrote, it seems odd to me that the American people have immediately accepted the fact that one man can brainwash 900 human beings into mass suicide, but will not accept the fact that a ruthless group, the Symbionese Liberation Army, could brainwash a little girl by torture, degradation, and confinement. 
When President Carter was considering clemency for Hearst, an astonishingly large number of supporters lobbied the president and Carter commuted her sentence in 2001 after serving 22 months in prison. Even the Department of Justice was willing to go along with that, uh, that brainwashing was a mitigating factor or that kidnapping was a mitigating factor. But could brainwashing exonerate her? Years later, people lobbied President Clinton to pardon Hearst. Um, the Justice Department uniformly opposed a pardon. While they're okay with softening the, her prison in time, it struck in their crawl that she should be retroactively declared innocent. Robert Mueller, um, then United States Attorney, strongly opposed the, the, the pardon, saying her request repeats her false and self-serving version of events after her kidnapping. Hours before President Clinton left office, he pardoned her. I will now fast forward. Patty Hearst regained national attention when her Shih Tzu dog won best in breed at the Westminster Dog Show in 2015. And again, when her bulldog, French bulldog, won uh, best in breed in 2017. Given the twists and turns of this case, was Patty Hearst brainwashed or had she fallen in with a bad crowd and made a mistake? What do you think? <laughs>